Welcome to the Heart to Kill podcast, the official podcast of the Heart to Kill program, the world's leading program for driven individuals looking to gain direction and momentum, where we aim to break down the complex, multifaceted and holistic factors of human performance and optimization. Both on the program and on this podcast, we will be discussing and excavating everything pertaining to psychological resilience, physical robustness, and leading by example with discipline and tenacity to create a culture of winning, especially in the turbulent, frenetic, and high tempo world of the ambitious individual. This is Mark, the creator, senior DS and head coach of the Heart of Kill program. Let's get stuck straight into it. Okay, so on today's episode, what I wanted to discuss was confidence. So we are going to run through uh, the two specific types of confidence and we're going to specifically identify and work upon one of those two. What we're then going to do is expand upon the four different stages of that type of confidence and we're going to talk about how we can get you from the bottom stage to essentially transcending to the top stage whereby you are brimming with the positive sense of the word confidence okay but before we get to that i just want to kind of give a bit of background a little bit of context and a little bit of rationale as to why we're even discussing this and why i feel it's important that we talk about this in the first instance okay so people obviously have a perception of who i am based on an identity that they have formulated through pictures on Instagram, social media, and or other platforms, okay? Irrespective of, of what that is, is irrelevant. Your mind is going to piece together and make assumptions based on the experiences, lived experiences that you have gone through, the belief systems you've inherited through your life up to that point, okay? So you're already potentially projecting belief systems and what you perceive to be me as an identity, okay? Irrespective of whether or not that's true, I know my identity from the inside out. So the life that I have led and the times in which, although externally, it may seem that my confidence has been extraordinarily high. It's actually been in the gutter for want of a better phrase. And over the past 10 years specifically, um, I've done an enormous amount of work on understanding why I felt certain ways and, and finding ways and strategies and education and resources in order to, to boost and, and bolster that and then fortify my understandings and create um, resources and essentially a mental toolkit and an arsenal of, of different things I can bring to bear in order to, to make myself feel better on any one given day. But also myself and the Hard to Kill directing staff have now utilize those resources and deployed them effectively with hundreds of clients out of the Hard to Kill program. We've seen the exact same advantageous output and the same beneficial result with every single person that we've applied them to. So therefore, like we have a strong reason to believe that what we're talking about is legitimate, that it is fortified, that it has stood up to the rigors of being repeated time and time and time again. And we've been able to replicate the outcome time and time and time again. But the first thing I wanted to, to get at was essentially that, you know, people might perceive that I've always been confident or it's very easy for me to speak in front of a camera or record podcasts or write social media content, the, the total opposite is true. And actually, I'd, I'd say to you that anyone you perceive to be extremely confident probably is coming across so because they've had times and they've had their confidence absolutely decimated and then they've had to find ways to pick themselves up and keep themselves moving forward. And it's the stories they have internally, intrinsically about those situations, about those episodes of, of true resilience. Those are the stories that have equipped them to then be viewed as confident from an external perspective. Okay, so please do not fall into the trap of believing that I've always been confident, that I've always been someone who finds it easy to articulate himself, speak in public, on podcasts, whatever it may be, because if you were to regress, you know, pre sort of even university, even then I was riddled with low self-confidence through sort of my teen adolescent years, because I was always in this identity crisis, not really knowing who I was, if I fitted in, knowing that I thought differently to a lot of people around me, that I wasn't necessarily the happiest kid in my home environment, my confidence was really, really quite low. And this is something that we identify in an enormous amount of people in society. And that's basically why it is that we're going to be talking about this topic and this subject today. Okay. Now, that doesn't for a moment mean that to take value from this, you've got to be a fucking broken biscuit. You've got to come from a fucking broken home and have been fucking beaten up every day of your life by your parents or, you know, you've got to have massive misdemeanors or anything like that. Because the truth is, the scientific data and the evidence shows us that although people are accruing wealth and comfort at an accelerated rate in the world that we now live in, and we have more than we've ever had, actually rates of depression, anxiety, suicide, and low self-confidence are the most epidemic they have ever been. So I do feel it's important that we begin to talk about the concept of self-confidence because in my personal opinion, that is that that is almost the gateway drug that goes on to episodes of, of depressive emotions and essentially eventually depression and, and wherever you want to go with that conversation. So that's why I feel it's important for us to discuss this today. And now let's get straight into it. Okay, so let's take a look identifying the two specific types of confidence that we're going to be referring to here today. The first is interpersonal confidence. Okay, so again, you viewing me from an external perspective, and even anyone viewing the candidates that we work with and the clients that we have inside the Hard to Kill program may be guilty of thinking, well, they all look like really confident. How could 
they possibly have low confidence? If they've got low confidence, then that must be really fucked. But understand that there are two different types of confidence here. And that's why we're making a specific effort to, to identify them as separate entities. So interpersonal confidence is something that the vast majority of people have. So, you know, we work with a very high percentage of individuals in law enforcement, um, in, in the military, in really high flying and professional roles in, in corporate sectors, even through to just people that, you know, are professionally are, are doing jobs like you, like you or I. You know, they don't have to be these absolute fucking Spartans or these warriors or these like super cops or any of those sort of, sorts of things. But you know, we're working with people who have to communicate both to their superiors and to their subordinates on a daily basis. And they're capable and able of doing so to a really high standard. They can clearly articulate and communicate their point. They can uh, potentially initiate conflict if necessary and say, I don't agree with that. Here's an alternate action plan. I think we should go with this for X reasons. They're really competent and capable in doing that. And that's because it's interpersonal confidence. It's how they're interacting with the world around them. So that's as much as I really want to talk about that today. I'm going to park that and leave that to one side, potentially for later episodes and, and future dates. But I'm going to park that and leave that to one side for the moment because what we're specifically referring to today is the other type of confidence, which is self-confidence. So largely, this is how we're talking to ourselves about ourselves. It is the constant inner narrative that we have inside our mind. It's how we see ourselves. And it's also how we see ourselves in relation to the world around us. So understand self-confidence is, is, is almost everything. Like without a degree of self-confidence, your capacity to make decisions, to communicate to yourself, to trust yourself, to improve self-reliance, to express discipline, to have any kind of consistency. All of those are immediately mitigated if you do not have a degree of self-confidence. Be very, very, very clear on that. And if you're coming to this conversation as somebody who potentially either has low self-confidence right now, or you perceive that you do, or has in the past, you will immediately resonate, identify with that. It becomes so hard to make decisions because you just, you overthink everything. There's a constant ongoing conversation of, I want to do that. Oh yeah, but X, Y, and Z. And, well, you can't because this, and this has to be done. And oh, what if they think this? And then there's paralysis by that. It's constant ongoing and it's exhausting. So this is what we're talking about today. Now, inside of the realm of self-confidence, there are four distinct divided stages or phases, whatever it is you, you wish to call them. The first, which is honestly where we tend to meet most people, is what's referred to as a cannot do, cannot happen stage of self-confidence. So let's break that down and, and talk about what we mean in this in this uh, sense. So cannot do refers to an individual who's in a stage of such low self-confidence that they do not actually believe they are capable of doing the activities, tasks, or otherwise that are associated with creating an outcome. So a fantastic example of this is let's talk about someone who's, who's tried prolifically to lose weight and it's been quite cyclical and to all intents and purposes has been unsuccessful. They've been a yo-yo dieter if we want to put society's terminology on it. They've been a yo-yo dieter for years. Every time they've been engaged with diet culture, they found it really hard to stick to. They found it overly restrictive. It's, it's been largely unsustainable and they just don't enjoy it. So to that extent, they just can't they don't believe they can muster up the willpower or the motivation, whatever you want to call it, in order to stick to that diet. So they believe, I can't actually do it. I can't actually stick to the diet in the way that is necessary or they perceive is necessary to lose body weight. That is what can't do means. Now, in specific reference to can't happen, let's use that same analogy. Let's keep running with that same analogy. This person has had so many exposures and so many failed hypotheses of what it takes to lose weight that even in the, the, the few moments when they have been able to create a dietary adherence, when they have been able to really force themselves to stick to it and eat fucking fish a rice cake multiple times per day. They believe there are some magic larger than them, external forces acting upon them, which means that they are not able to achieve the outcome. So they know they can do, they, th they think they can do what they need to do. So I think I can stick to this diet. I'm going to go really hard on it. I've stopped it for three weeks, but I've always been like this. My family is big boned. These are the kinds of belief systems that are associated with a can't happen mentality. Okay. And they are, they are rife and they are typically installed upon us or projected upon us by society and then we inherit them as belief systems or you know, the human mind is a problem solving machine it is constantly trying to create narratives in order to make sense of the world around us which is an enormous and largely confusing world at the moment so it pieces together bits of information in order to make stories but often two plus two does not equal four two plus two equals 97 okay we haven't really made true sense we've there's been multiple belief systems and filters and paradigms that have worked us towards that equation it's not actually truthful or based on any kind of reality whatsoever so that is what we refer to as a can't do can't happen phase of self-confidence. Moving up the chain, we then have can do can't happen. So this individual now really believes that they can do the tasks associated with achieving that outcome. But for whatever reason, that outcome is not possible for them. So again, let's use that same analogy. Let's use the individual who wants to run 10k. Okay. And in the past, they've tried it and they've got injured or they've like they've been exhausted or they've burnt out or they've not been able to do it. They've never been able to finish it, whatever. Okay. This individual has now been bestowed with the information and the training advice to say, look, we've got 
want to break this down, we want to slow it down. Let's follow uh, a progressive and accumulative training program over the course of six months to take you from doing absolutely nothing to running 10 kilometers successfully nonstop in under 60 minutes. Okay, fantastic. This person is now following the training program, they're doing extraordinarily well. So they're beginning to believe that they can do this. And I, I fucking can do this. You know, I've been training for multiple weeks. I'm not exhausted. I'm not getting any injuries. I'm actually quite enjoying it. I can do this. And then society's beliefs bestows themselves upon them once again. And they believe that oh, I'm just not a natural born runner. That's a really fucking common one. It's like pro tip, we are all natural born runners. We just then live in a life. We live life in a way that's not conducive to, con to being able to continue to demonstrate that skill. So we kind of train ourselves out of it. So yeah, they believe they can do it. But then they believe that, that it can't happen to them because I'm not a natural born runner. Or maybe I'm too heavy. Maybe I'm too big boned, whatever it is. So that's an example of can't do, can't happen psychology or a stage of self-confidence. Moving on past that, we then have an alternate, which is essentially can't do, but can happen. So maybe this individual has seen the zero to 10K training program work for somebody else. So they do know that if you're able to follow it, the outcome can happen. They have got social proof, which is something that's phrase that's coined and thrown around an awful lot in the world of online coaching and marketing, which is you, know, you must give social proof. You must constantly slam people in the face of adverts that my client did this that I told them to do and I'm fucking mega and now they got that result and you can do the same. That's essentially what is happening is your bit that building can happen feeling of self-confidence. But if for whatever reason, they don't believe that they're going to be able to adhere to that plan, whether that's, uh, I don't have enough time. Uh, I can't afford that plan. Uh, or I find it really hard to stick to training plans. Uh, I need someone every step of the way shouting at me. Uh, I need someone to tell me blah, 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 whatever it is. I understand the reason I know this so well is because they are so old hat. They are so recycled, perpetuated. They're what we call external interferences. They are they are excuses and that are actually formulated as belief systems and a friction from our unconscious mind. So that's a great example of can happen. A person knows it can happen, but they don't believe in their ability to do it. Okay. So we've got can't do, can't happen. Then a person can either go to can do, can't happen or can't do, can happen. But essentially the goal should always be to move you to can do, can happen. So let's use the same analogy now. Let's use an individual who's 19 years old, aspires to join the British Army, and for a long time, maybe they were overweight, they were unfit, they were weak, and they had injuries, and they thought, there's no way I'm going to be able to join the British Army. Like one of the best fighting forces on the face of the earth. Well drilled, well administered, incredibly well trained. There's no chance that I'm going to pass the selection criteria to join the British Army. Lo and behold, they start taking action. They follow a progressive and accumulative training plan that is strategically built for them. It's reverse engineered. It's got KPIs factored in. They've thought through properly with regards to their goal setting. So their meaningful goals that are strategically broken up, they're being held accountable to the process. And they start thinking, oh, hold on, I can actually do this now. Like I have a real belief. I have a fucking shot at this. Like my run times are getting faster. My body weight's dropping. My joint pain's gone. I can do the, the press ups and the pull ups. I can do the mid thigh pull. I can do the med. I can do this now. And then through testing batteries in their training block, they're actually performing the tests well ahead of schedule, well in advance of schedule. And they're actually going to go to uh, ADSC and be selected on that criteria to join the British Army, they've actually passed it. Now they believe what well, this can happen. All that stuff I told myself about, I'm not from a military family, uh, maybe I'm just not the right kind of person to do this, or I'm not meant to strong enough. All that stuff has evaporated. Now this individual believes they can do it because they've shown themselves to be able to do it for months on end. And it can happen because they've just passed the testing criteria. So they know now, they walk around with a degree of self-confidence that has come from these actions to help them understand if I do X, then Y will happen. And that's essentially where we aspire to get every single client in the Heart to Kill program. Program. And in the wider sense, every single individual who listens to this podcast should now be able to identify the difference between interpersonal confidence and self-confidence and then break down and analyze potentially where they're at in those four stages of self-confidence. And if you're at stage one, can't do, can't happen, that's almost a positive occurrence that you've identified that because rather than just accepting that that is your future and that is a terminate and a finite diagnosis of pathological dysfunction that you have and it's never going to get any better, you've now been given an understanding that it can improve and you can do it. So now we're going to talk about how that an individual can increase and improve their self-confidence. First thing we need to do is we need to decipher and determine the difference between self-esteem and self-confidence because they're often used in synchronicity, but they are very, very different things. So self-esteem as an example, is putting on your fucking war paint and all your fucking glad rag before going out on the piss and looking at me and think, I look fucking mega. Like, I'm absolutely fucking essence. I look mega. Understand that is not self-confidence. That is what we refer to as self-esteem. It's feeling good about yourself in the moment. Been hitting the gym for a couple of months, starting to look pretty buff, fucking got a veil in your bicep, so shit's starting to get pretty serious. Been watching what you eat, all that sort of good shit. Look at yourself in the mirror and think, I'm the fucking dog bollocks. Honestly, I'm an absolute fucking bee's knees. 
I look the part here. Again, there's an element of, in- of confidence with that, but largely it's self-esteem. Understand that self-confidence comes with self-esteem, but self-esteem in isolation can actually reduce self-confidence. And here's why. Anytime you place your worth or you validate yourself on something external to yourself, you lose. Because in that setting, it can be taken away from you. The second you believe you own, hold, have, or possess anything by default, it can be taken away, removed, or stripped from you. In which case, with it goes your fucking self-esteem or your perception of self-confidence. Let's pretend we've got a, a geezer going out, skin tight fucking t-shirt on all that good shit like you see downtown on the weekend. And then all of a sudden he starts to think his muscles have gone flat. From the pump he got in the gym before he went out, his muscles have gone flat. Then some cunt spills a fucking drink down his top. So he's got to change his top out. And now the top doesn't fit quite properly. It doesn't hug his arms. And all, before you know it, the cunt's fucking twitching in his shirt like he's on fucking meth because he's trying to get it to fit properly, trying to get it to hang properly. His head's on a fucking swivel looking around at anything slightly reflective to make sure that he's fucking looking the, the part He's holding his arm in a stupid fucking way so it looks like his biceps are bigger than they actually are. Is that a confident person? Very not. Again, the exact same is true with an individual who's got themselves really lean. Now, it takes a real effort. As someone who's won trophies for getting very, very lean, it takes real fucking hard work and effort to get that. But is it self-confidence? No, it is not. Because when you perceive you have something new because of how you look, well, guess what? Like, in the longer term, even if you're able to maintain that, body fat will eventually come to you. Muscles will eventually atrophy. Joints will get injured. Beauty fades. If you want to talk about in the wider world, houses depreciate, cars rust, all this shit that people perceive as building confidence is actually just self-esteem and again when you believe believe you possess something it can be taken away from you and if you're someone who is very very lean and you know looks fantastic on holiday you'll know the sensation of getting in the airport quaffing a fucking pint of Stella having a full English because it's basically law to do so before you go on on a beach holiday so I'm told and then add to that the water retention that comes with aviation with it with cabin pressure and flying you get off in like a fucking water balloon okay so all the definition that you had is checked out within if it hasn't been already two days of all inclusive fucking chips and Aperol spritz is definitely going to leave the chat and before you know it all that confidence that you had is gone now you're back to wearing vests and yeah your fucking delts and arms look mega but aside from that you're like second guessing yourself and you know it in the back of your mind yep everyone's shaking out my fucking delts and arms but below this is a piss tank okay so you, that's not confidence and that's not to be disrespectful or to undermine anyone in either of those settings it's simply just use analogies with slightly tongue in cheek and a little bit of humour to identify the difference between self-esteem and self-confidence so now we've made that derivation now we understand and that what self-confidence is not. Let's talk about what self-confidence is. Self-confidence as its at its absolute core, at its being, foundationally, is self-talk. That's all that it is. It is what you are saying to yourself about yourself. It is the inner conversation, those inner narratives you're having constantly that you cannot escape from. But understand, it has to be credible. There has to be a body of truthful evidence that you can communicate from your unconscious to your conscious mind that shows you you're the person that you aspire to be. Okay, so confidence is largely going to be based and centered around like what it is you actually aspire to do. So let's take the obvious analogy of training because we're on a podcast that largely talks about training and psychological resilience. An individual wakes up and the night before they had great intentions, like they, they were going to get down the gym, they're going to get their fifth done by half, uh, get in the gym at half six and they're going to be nipped by eight o'clock and they're in work and they're going to feel mega about themselves. Half six rolls around, fucking snooze the alarm. Okay, it might feel good, might give you a temporary bit of comfort, but once you wake up and you realize that you're in the now car to work and you haven't done the training session that you expected yourself and you promised yourself to do, your inner narrative, your inner conversation is not going to be a particularly positive one. In fact, it's not largely going to be self-critical and self-deprecating. And now people often try and humorize this and shrug this off and you'll see various memes about people that were going to get up to the gym but then didn't, so they laugh about it. Okay, humor is fantastic, but we all know that it's just, it's just covering something. Okay, it's just covering the fact that deep down you are potentially quite concerned about that. Now, if you repeat that process for a two, three, five, ten, how many times, the only evidence you have for that inner conversation is that you're an individual who fucking lies to himself, who makes false promises they didn't follow through on, who, who is not a reliable individual. So is it any wonder why in that situation, circumstance, individual self-confidence starts to erode? Okay, now obviously you'll start to be, you'll start to observe and become aware that self-confidence is in a good place and you do want to do something about it. So this is typically when people are like, right, I need to do something about it. I'm going to get a really strict plan. I need to be harder on myself. I'm going to more disciplined. I'm going to throw the fucking kitchen sink at this. I'm going to really hard. Like I need to be strict. I need to be disciplined, which will normally work for maybe a few days until you get tired and then energy drops. Snooze enters the chat because that's the decision that you've ingrained that you've fallen back on multiple times before. So that's all you have to lean back on. That's all you'll reach for when you are in situations of fatigue. Before you know it, it's happened again. You have now shown that you are not a reliable individual, that you have no difficulties letting yourself down and you, you can't hold yourself accountable 
accountable. So now you were initially feeling a lack of self-confidence in the first instance. And you did something about it, so you were starting to feel better. And now you've even like subordinated that again. So self-confidence drops and drops and drops. So do you can see how this now cascades and we get what's called system drift. So any complex adaptive system, i.e. your mind or you as a human, any complex adaptive system without feedback will decrementally drift until the point of total catastrophic error. So if you were to plot it on a graph and you watch them on YouTube, this will make sense. If you're listening on the podcast, just imagine that you know, you're drawing a graph and there's a, there's a line of trend, that line will decrementally decrease down unless there's something you know, disturbing it in a, in a positive sense and sending it upwards on a northward trajectory. That's what we call system drift. And it will continue to do so until that point it hovers just above total catastrophic failure and then something will take it across the line. But owing to what I said earlier about humans needing to create narratives and stories in order to piece pieces of information together what we will then do is we'll only look for one occurrence that just happened in the immediate immediate history and we'll look to palpate and, and, and finger don't laugh at that finger that as the culprit um for the for the reason why when actually this has been going on for weeks and months preceding that so that is kind of how confidence begins to suffer and then what tends to happen is we spend a disproportionately high amount of time in our own mind we begin to self-deprecate we begin to self-criticize and we begin asking questions of ourselves about everything about our the validity of our decisions is that the best thing to be doing what if we did that well, I could do that. Well, should we do that? Well, I don't know. You, you begin to stop relying on yourself because the narrative you're having intrinsically and internally is not a good one. But let's give you another analogy. Let's pretend that the individual had got very excited um, to train in the morning because they've got a new training program. Maybe they've joined, uh, started working with a coach, whatever it is, and they know that they're going to get it done tomorrow before work. And they've created like an actual strategic plan They've laid out their kit and equipment. So basically all they've got to do is roll out of bed, get hydrated, bag on back, out the fucking door, they're squared away. They're in the gym. And whilst it might not be perfect, you know, they maybe missed a couple of sets because they're rushing around or a piece of equipment was occupied. They genuinely got up when they said they were going to get up. They got in the gym and they did their session to the very best of their ability and controlled everything inside of their control. They're then in the showers, squared away, in their suit, sat at their desk, at work, 0900, energies through the roof, feeling fantastic and almost a little bit smug about themselves. What are they then able to say to themselves at the end of that day? When they're writing down in their journal, which is another practice associated with building self-confidence. Today, I didn't feel like getting out of bed at half six. I actually was fucking knackered. I didn't sleep very well last night because I was anxious about tomorrow morning going well. But despite the fact I didn't feel like it, I had mental friction. I was a bit nervous. First time back in the gym in six months. I fucking did it. Okay, I turned up and once I got there, I fucking loved it. I really enjoyed it. Like, it was. I feel incredible for doing that. Like, really well done. Pat on the back. They go to bed that night. Again, same procedure. Kit is laid out. And now what they've done is they've created a positive feedback loop. So they got a little squirt of dopamine and epinephrine at the time when they were actually training that morning. And then when they repeated it and they were critically analyzing and reviewing and reflecting upon their day, they've written it down. And again, they've got another little squirt of dopamine. And this is largely how humans learn. Okay, when you're rewarded with that pleasure hormone and that hormone of pursuit, you're like, well, I want to do that again. Like that made me feel good. I want to do that again. And I was able to give myself a pat on the back and that felt good. And I do that again. So the next morning, they feel a little bit tired, maybe a little bit sore from the day before. And they get up and they do it. And then the next day, they're scheduled a rest day. So instead they go, okay, I'm going to do some stretching or some cardio. And they get up and they do it again. They overcome friction. They turn up. They do the repetitions. The session was really hard. They felt like quitting, but they thought, nope, because if I push through, I'm going to feel really good. And they fucking do it. At the end of the day, they critically reflect and they analyze. This is how you build confidence. Again, to reiterate that point, it is how you talk to yourself about yourself. Are you a person who gives up when they can't be bothered? Or are you an individual who relies upon yourself? Are you an individual who lies to other people? Or are you an individual who is honest to yourself? Because the truth is, you know, the reality is I hear a lot of bullshit every day. People lie to me every single day about what's happened in their life. Not necessarily clients on the program because they won't find themselves there if we feel then they don't have a lot of integrity. But people in the inbox lie to me all the time. And um, I, I'm never confrontational. I'm never disrespectful. I'm never even frustrated by it. I'm often empathetic because you cannot lie to anybody else until you have first lied to yourself. So are you an individual who can be relied upon, who has integrity, or are you an individual who lies to yourself because even if you tell a white lie to somebody else or a lie to somebody else to get out of something they may believe it you might be off the hook but you know you lied to yourself and then what are you reaffirming that your unconscious mind is listening to that irrespective of whether you think this is left of center and it's a bit woo woo and a bit out there and spiritual it doesn't matter whether you fucking believe it or not it is the truth and we have implemented it and the science and literature and bodies of evidence show this to be true and this is how you improve self-confidence from the highest performing sports teams to special operators in you know the u.s um, navy like the evidence and data is in like unwaveringly there 
the evidence and the data is unmistakable as to how impactful and beneficial it is for building self-confidence. You know, I've spoken a little bit on my stories and I hope to do future podcasts about how we overcome real adversity and overcome real challenge in the moment or in the, in the more chronic sense. And all you're going to have to fall back on, if that's all your mind is actively going to reach out for, are the decisions and the impulses that you have a catalogue of evidence of being successful for in the past. And if that's taking the easy route, that's what you're going to go for. Like, it doesn't matter what you think you would do. It doesn't matter what you believe to be true. You have to ingrain it over hard sessions, over difficult decisions, over weeks and months. You have to have ingrained that. And that's essentially how we view training in a hard to kill program. Many of the clients inside the program aspire to go on to pass promotion cards, arduous courses, uh, do their first triathlons, Ironmans, many of whom are almost sort of quote unquote recreational trainees, but are pursuing the greatest version of themselves in the business sphere. Or they want to become an inspirational father figure or role model. Irrespective of the outcome, we view training in the same way for all of those. Some of them are going to be tested. There are metrics they have to be able to hit in order to pass the outcome. Others, we are still going to use training in the exact same way. We are going to ask them to do very challenging things that induce an enormous amount of physiological pain, almost some psychological pain because of the fear about doing it and not feeling like they're good enough. But in those moments, that is when the unconscious mind is going to give you the opportunity to make decisions. And the decisions that you make there, again, are the ones that are reaffirmed, that are ingrained and that are, are there and available for us to fall back on. So at the individual that you're seeing who is turning up and making the right decision week in, week out and being consistent is conditioning that. So don't look at the outcome. Don't look at what they've achieved. Think about the processes that have gone into that, the decisions that are made and what stage of confidence they are in. And if you identify an individual who has traits that you aspire to have, then you can have it for yourself. Okay. Again, we'll go back to the four stages of self-confidence. You just might not be in phase four just yet. But again, when we look at transcending like the logical of situations, look at the psychological, that is very much what we specialize in. And what I arguably believe that we are the very best in the world at doing here in the hard skill program is taking an individual from stage one of confidence or any of those three stages of confidence and placing them right on the top shelf and giving them the tools, the training, the resource, the education, and the strategy to be able to stay there indefinitely for the rest of their life through any adversity, challenge, difficulty, or puzzle. They have the education, the emotional awareness, and emotional sophistication to be able to stay there, to hold on to that top rung, and essentially have an unfair advantage over anybody else in life because of the decisions that they've made and the confidence that they have earned. Thank you.